Uh-oh, hurricane alert! Everyone's hiding! The speed of the wind outside is more than 75 miles per hour. Seems like a lot. But this storm is moving at 400 miles per hour. Wait, do such speeds exist? Yep, but to see a storm that fast, you'll have to travel to Jupiter. So let the journey begin. The planet is huge. Almost 1,300 Earths could fit into this gas giant. It's also incredibly hot, with the temperatures reaching about 43,000 degrees Fahrenheit at the planet's core. Unfortunately, you can't land on Jupiter's surface because, well, being a gas giant, it doesn't have any solid surface. But you can go deeper into Jupiter's atmosphere. Look at these thick brown, yellow, red, and white clouds passing by. They're what make the planet look colorful and kind of striped. If you continue descending toward the center of the planet, you'll see its atmosphere, mostly made up of hydrogen and helium gas, becoming liquid. It happens because of immense atmospheric pressure. The planet's core itself is a mysterious object. Scientists still haven't figured out whether it's a molten ball of thick liquid or a solid rock 14 to 18 times the mass of Earth. Anyway, exploring Jupiter isn't the main goal of your trip. No, you've arrived here to see the Great Red Spot. It's an enormous storm raging in the southern hemisphere of the gas giant. Its top parts are towering more than 5 miles above the tops of the surrounding clouds. The storm is 1.3 times wider than our planet. In 2017, NASA's Juno space probe managed to collect lots of data about the red spot. And it turned out that this monster of a storm goes more than 200 miles down into the planet's atmosphere. That's 30 to 100 times deeper than any ocean on Earth. But these measurements are most likely imprecise, and the storm's true roots can be reaching even deeper. The Great Red Spot is colder than the rest of the atmosphere. And keep in mind that Jupiter's temperatures are minus 234 degrees Fahrenheit in the upper cloud layers. On the other hand, the closer to the core, the hotter it gets. Mysteriously, the highest temperatures ever recorded on the gas giant occurred in the atmosphere right above the Great Red Spot. There, the heat reached 2,400 degrees. This temperature is higher than that of lava on our planet. Astronomers believe that the turbulence caused by the storm might produce gravitational and sound waves that can be responsible for the superheating. But the storm itself is warmer at the bottom than at the top. People have been watching the moving vortex on Jupiter for more than 150 years. Some time ago, astronomers predicted that it would gradually slow down and become smaller or disappear entirely. But that turned out not to be the case. After having analyzed all the data received with the help of the Hubble Space Telescope, researchers were baffled to discover that the winds at the outer boundaries of the storm had actually picked up speed. The change in the wind speed is no more than 1.5 miles per hour during one Earth year. It's a tiny change, but however small the difference is, it still means a lot. The wind speed at the edges of the storm can reach a mind-boggling 400 miles per hour. That's faster than Earth's tornadoes. At the same time, if you found yourself at the center of the Great Red Spot, you wouldn't be too impressed. The winds there move way more slowly. Scientists faced lots of challenges when they were trying to understand the mystery that was the Great Red Spot. It's unclear what fuels the storm. Can it be the nature of the storm's home planet? Since it's a gas giant, Jupiter doesn't have any solid ground, so there's no friction, which might be the only thing that could make the storm weaken. The hot gases in the planet's atmosphere are always moving, rising, falling, swirling, just like on our home planet, where cooler and warmer air mix and merge into one another, forming giant circling storms. Astronomers think that once, several enormous storms could have come together and created the Great Red Spot. And now, it keeps going by constantly drawing cool gases from below and hot gases from above. Plus, the storm might be absorbing other smaller vortices. This makes the Great Red Spot even more powerful.
A black hole is a place where gravity is so strong that even light can't get out. But black holes can sometimes behave like a massive galactic volcano. From time to time, they flare up. Sounds like me. But instead of spewing lava, they produce enormous amounts of energy. And this phenomenon leaves gaping holes in the surrounding material and gas. A short while ago, scientists discovered one of the largest craters in the universe. Radio and X-ray telescopes detected a supermassive black hole that threw a temper tantrum many, many years ago. It happened in a galaxy cluster about 390 million light-years away from Earth. The crater this event left behind could fit 15 Milky Way galaxies. Yeah, I can't get my head around that either. During your space voyage, think twice before landing on unknown planets. Otherwise, you may end up in a place like K2-141b. That's a planet outside of our solar system. At first glance, it's not that different from Earth. It has liquid oceans that evaporate, form clouds, condense, and get back to the surface as rain. But instead of water, it rains rocks. The surface of this exoplanet is covered with lava seas dozens of miles deep. The temperatures on the K2-141b reach 5,000 degrees during the day. That's toasty enough for the magma in the oceans to vaporize into the atmosphere. Then, supersonic winds, which can move at the speed of 1 mile per second, carry this rock vapor into the planet's night side. The vaporized magma cools down, becomes liquid again, and falls as a rocky rain. Uh Uh-uh, not a vacation spot. Too hot. I'll pass. Imagine a still, frozen world. It's ancient, about 4.5 billion years old. It's barely heated by the rays of the sun and covered with a thick layer of ice. This world is smaller than our moon, but a bit larger than Pluto. Its name is Europa, the sixth satellite of Jupiter and one of the biggest moons in the solar system. But the coolest thing about this faraway place, it might host life. Astronomers consider Europa one of the most promising places in the solar system to search for new life forms. All because this moon has a huge saltwater ocean with a depth of 40 to 100 miles. Yes, it is hidden under a layer of ice that is estimated to be from 10 to 20 miles thick. But it is still potentially habitable. Astronomers claim that plumes of water erupt from cracks in the ice shell and release the contents of the moon's ocean into space. Of course, it's going to be challenging for any life-seeking missions to access such a deep environment. On the bright side, scientists already have some evidence that there are way shallower pools that probably lie much closer to the surface of the moon. They might be located even less than one mile under the ice. And there are two great things about this news. First of all, it boosts the odds of life existing on Europa. And secondly, if it's true, it can make it easier for future missions to find these life forms, if there are any. Interestingly, the new discovery about these shallow pools came about by sheer luck. The scientist leading the research, Riley Kohlberg, accidentally saw a presentation of his colleague, a planetary scientist. That scientist showed a picture of double ridges on the surface of Europa, and Kohlberg remembered that he had seen similar ridges on Earth. But while such formations are rare on our planet, they are way more numerous on Europa. The following studies suggested that the ridges on Jupiter's moon might be the result of a specific cycle, similar to that on Earth. In this cycle, liquid water freezes and then thaws inside an ice sheet, which is a rather high-pressure environment. This causes the sheet to move upward over and over again, creating a two-peaked structure. Or at least, that's what happens on Earth. If the processes on Europa are similar, It can prove the presence of shallow waters on the satellite. Of course, the temperature, pressure, and chemistry are very different on Europa. And scientists don't know yet how the ice behaves there. That's why they can't understand how deep or large the water pockets are, or how long they need to refreeze. But what is more or less clear is that such under-ice environments on Europa are very likely to be protected from Jupiter's harsh radiation battering the satellite's surface which, in turn, increases the chances of life existing on Europa. Now, can we get back to the fact that the ocean on Europa seems to be salty? Red streaks on the satellite's surface might have this color due to their chemical content. They're likely a frozen mixture of water and salts. 
This is quite unusual because such a composition doesn't match any known substance here on Earth. As for yellow spots on Europa's surface, those might be caused by the presence of sodium chloride. You know this substance as good old table salt. Scientists tried to recreate the conditions on Europa in a lab. They discovered that by combining water, table salt, freezing temperatures, and high pressure, they could get a new kind of solid crystal. This substance might exist both at the bottom of Europa's ocean and on the moon's surface. But besides this information, researchers are in the dark. Hopefully, we'll find the answers to some of these questions around 2030. That's when a mission called Europa Clipper, which is going to be launched by NASA, will probably reach Europa. The mission is going to have several close flybys and figure out if any form of life can exist on the moon. The European Space Agency's JUICE, which stands for the Jupiter Icy Moons Explorer, is going to visit Europa in the next couple of years too. But Europa isn't the only place in the solar system that might host or once hosted life. In 2003, Mars Express, a spacecraft launched by the European Space Agency, discovered methane in the atmosphere of Mars. On our planet, the biggest part of this gas in the atmosphere is produced by living creatures, for example, by cattle digesting food. However, scientists think that methane was stable in the Martian atmosphere for about 300 years. And then, in 2006, the methane almost entirely vanished from the red planet and it happened 600 times faster than researchers' models accounted for. The question, what or who generated the gas? And where did it go? Another Martian mystery is microbes that may be sleeping beneath the surface of Mars. There, they might have been protected from the harsh radiation coming from space for millions of years. Scientists simulated the conditions on Mars in a lab to check if it could possibly be true and they were amazed to find out that bacteria could easily survive in such conditions for 280 million years. Which means that if life existed on Mars, we could find the evidence in the planet's subsurface by drilling into the Martian soil. Right now, there is no flowing water on Mars, and cells or spores would simply dry out. Plus, the surface temperature is similar to that of dry ice. In other words, the surface of the planet is deeply frozen, and still, there could be six types of bacteria and fungi living underground on the red planet. The most likely of them is nicknamed Conan the Bacterium due to its tough nature. Well, I guess time will show. Now let's move to Venus. In 2020, scientists announced that in the toxic Venusian atmosphere, there was something that might mean the existence of life. Unfortunately, Scientists didn't have any evidence, since there was no chance to collect any microbe specimens or snap any pictures of extraterrestrial life. But they claimed that they had discovered a chemical called phosphine there, and it was a big deal. If it wasn't some previously unknown chemistry that was producing this gas, then there could be some kind of microbial life involved in the process. Phosphine is made up of three atoms of hydrogen and one atom of phosphorus, this gas is toxic to any terrestrial life form that needs oxygen, including us humans. On our planet, phosphine can be found in places with no or little oxygen, for example, marshes and swamps. The gas is created by complex mixtures of bacteria living there. It can also be produced industrially. Come to think of it, phosphine isn't supposed to be in Venus's atmosphere altogether. This gas needs precise pressure and temperature and tons of hydrogen to form. It wouldn't be all that surprising to find it on Saturn or Jupiter famous gas giants. But on Venus? Totally unexpected. There's no way phosphine can be naturally produced on this planet. Tiny amounts of it can be created during volcanic eruptions, lightning storms, minerals blown up to the surface, or meteorites entering Venus's atmosphere. But not as much as astronomers thought they had observed. And it had to make scientists suspicious. But they were too happy about their discovery. They probably thought it meant there could be life on Venus. But even if this gas was created by some mysterious organisms, it would be a big question how they survived on Venus. On our planet, some microbes can thrive in environments with an acidity of 5%, but no more. On Venus, though, clouds are almost entirely made of acid, containing more than 90% of sulfuric acid. 
The Venusian atmosphere is also 50 times as dry as the driest place on our home planet. And indeed, in 2022, thanks to better and more high-resolution telescopes, it was concluded that there was no phosphine in Venus's atmosphere. Or even if there was, it was a very small amount. So far, we need to look for signs of life further away from Earth. A 40-year-long study has led astronomers to conclude that there's something seriously weird about Jupiter. The largest planet in the solar system doesn't seem to have seasons. The measurements have been taken both by spacecraft and ground-based telescopes. They showed bizarre weather patterns on the gas giant. For example, cold and hot periods throughout the year, which equal 12 Earth years. And at the same time, Jupiter doesn't go through seasonal changes like our planet. On Earth, weather changes between winter, spring, summer, and fall because of the tilt of our planet's axis toward the plane in which it orbits the Sun. This tilt, which is 23 degrees, allows different parts of the globe to receive different amounts of sunlight throughout the year. But Jupiter's axis is tilted toward its orbital plane by a mere 3 degrees. It means that the amount of sunlight that reaches different parts of the planet's surface throughout its long, long year hardly changes. But the new study has found that there are still certain temperature swings that take place all over the gas giant's cloud-covered globe. Astronomers claim they've solved one part of this puzzle. They've found some hints that such unseasonal seasons might have something to do with teleconnection. This phenomenon describes periodic atmospheric changes in seemingly unconnected parts of the globe, which can lie thousands of miles apart. Scientists have observed teleconnection in the atmosphere of our planet, too. One of the most famous examples is known as the Southern Oscillation. That's when changes in the trade winds of the Western Pacific Ocean correspond with changes in rainfall across large territories of North America. As for Jupiter, when temperatures rise in specific regions of the planet's northern hemisphere, the same latitudes in the southern hemisphere cool off. Further research also revealed that when temperatures rise in the upper layer of Jupiter's atmosphere, called the stratosphere, it gets colder in the troposphere. This is the lowest atmospheric layer where weather events, such as Jupiter's powerful storms, occur. Researchers hope that by measuring all these temperature changes, they will eventually be able to make a more or less precise weather forecast for Jupiter. Maybe in the future, they will even be able to extend this to other gas giants to see if they have similar patterns. But this isn't the only mystery the gas giant can boast. Let's have a look at some other, no less intriguing puzzles. For example, a 2018 study that found that Jupiter had a delayed growth spurt. You might have heard that the most popular theory about the beginning of the solar system says that, at first, the Sun was orbited by a dust-filled gas cloud. Some time passed, and tiny pieces gathered together into lumps, which later formed planets. But Jupiter was the odd kid. It started off well. The gas giant was gathering around small clumps of matter for a million years or so. But once it grew to be as massive as 20 Earths, its development suddenly stopped. It could have happened after bizarre zones appeared in space. They emitted so much heat and energy that gas molecules struggled to merge with young Jupiter. This period continued for 2 million years. During this time, Jupiter only grew to 50 times the mass of Earth. But once this stage finished, the planet continued to gobble down gas like before. And soon, it swelled to its current mass, about 300 Earths. Jupiter's most famous feature is the Great Red Spot a giant storm raging in the atmosphere of the planet and capable of engulfing two Earths. But few people know about the great cold spot. It was spotted only recently when astronomers were checking data received by an observatory in Chile. It's believed that Jupiter's auroras spawned this unusual patch, which is around 400 degrees Fahrenheit colder than the surrounding areas. These auroras are ancient. It makes the spot thousands of years old. And unlike the Great Red Spot, it's not stable. It keeps shape-shifting, and sometimes it almost disappears. But it always returns to the upper atmosphere. Usually, it happens after a powerful auroral display. Now, storms are no stranger to Jupiter's atmosphere. 
But where there are storms, there is lightning, right? Yeah, but the bolts of lightning on Jupiter turned out to be very strange. They release radio waves, which is not strange. But for decades, every spacecraft visiting the gas giant managed to record something bizarre. You see, Jupiter's lightning only signaled in the low-frequency range. And no theory could explain why, since lightning on Earth emits radio waves from low to very high frequencies. Finally, in 2018, the Juno space probe solved this mystery. Apparently, the problem was not with the gas giant, but with our technologies. Unlike previous spaceships, Juno had extremely sensitive equipment, and it came very close to Jupiter. So it did record both megahertz and even gigahertz strikes. But even Juno confirmed that lightning on Jupiter was totally different from lightning on Earth. On our planet, lightning avoids the poles. It prefers to zap the equator. Meanwhile, the gas giant's equatorial zone sees no lightning. It lights up the planet's poles. And its peak frequency is 4 bolts per second. In 2017, when astronomers were searching for the theoretical Planet X, they noticed that some object outside the solar system was tugging at objects within. Thinking it could be what they had been looking for, they turned a powerful telescope in that direction. Coincidentally, that patch of sky contained Jupiter. And even though the researchers didn't find Planet X, they noticed 10 previously unknown moons orbiting the gas giant. This brought the number of the planet's satellite to a total of 79. But the coolest thing was that one of the newly discovered moons was very unusual. The thing is, Jupiter's moons move in packs. So two of the new satellites were spinning with a group that rotated in the same direction as the gas giant. And the rest was in a cluster spinning against the planet's rotation. As for our weird guy, it was inside the second group, but spinning with Jupiter. Unfortunately, it means that the moon will most likely have a short lifespan. An anti-retrograde moon within a retrograde cluster won't be able to avoid a collision. Look at Jupiter's beautiful patterns. Look at these swirls and stripes. For a long time, no one knew the depths of these bands. But in 2018, scientists used a novel way to crack this riddle. This method involved the space probe Juno, which orbited the gas giant every 53 days. Each time it passed by, it measured how strong the pull of the planet's gravity was. It helped astronomers create a 3D image of the stripes. It goes like this. The greater the pull, the greater the mass of the region below. And after examining the gravitational map, researchers concluded that the stripes ran shockingly deep. Most of them plunged to a depth of 1,800 miles. But Jupiter is a gas world, and the winds raging in its atmosphere shift all that mass around, making calculations very difficult. Jupiter has the strongest magnetic field of all the planets in the solar system. It's 20,000 times more powerful than that of Earth. But the gas giant's magnetosphere is a bit wacky. It's unique and doesn't resemble the field of any other planet we know about. Before, experts thought that Jupiter's magnetic field was similar to Earth's. Two poles connected with magnetic lines near the geographical north and south. But Juno showed that things on Jupiter are a bit messed up. The magnetic south pole is pretty well behaved, but the north pole is a different story. Intensely magnetic ribbons and chaotic pieces of field some of them without even positive or negative counterparts. Plus, there seems to be another south pole. It might be that Jupiter's hydrogen ocean generates the magnetic field of the planet. And if scientists manage to solve the mystery of Jupiter's magnetosphere, they might also find out what's happening inside the gas giant. But first, they need to understand the bizarre behavior of the planet's poles. Imagine leaving your house one morning and seeing not one, but two stars shining in the sky. The first one is our good old sun, and the other is Jupiter. But how has a planet turned into a star? And what will now happen to Earth and its inhabitants? Before we find the answer to these urgent questions, we need to revise some things we know about Jupiter. The largest planet in the solar system is a gas giant which means it's made up mostly of gases. 
Due to the pressure and temperature differences, these gases separate into layers. This creates those red and white bands that can be clearly seen from Earth. The temperatures at the top of Jupiter's atmosphere are insane. They can reach a whopping 1,340 degrees Fahrenheit. The planet also has an immense gravitational pull. In 1995, the Galileo probe reached the atmosphere of Jupiter and sliced it at a speed of 106,000 miles per hour. It survived the scorching temperatures and started its descent. It kept moving even when the temperatures suddenly dropped and the pressure, as well as the speed of the wind, increased. But 58 minutes and 97 miles into its exploration, things went downhill. The pressure of 23 atmospheres and still high temperatures finished the probe off. It was melted and then vaporized by the extreme heat. Now, if Jupiter suddenly decided to keep growing, it would eventually become a star and its composition would allow this planet to do it. Once, a long, long time ago, Jupiter took most of the mass that was left after the formation of our Sun. That's how it ended up with more than twice the combined material of all other bodies in the solar system. And the planet's ingredients are the same as those of a star, mostly hydrogen and helium. Jupiter is just not massive enough to ignite. But what if it was? then it would turn into another kind of celestial body, most likely a brown dwarf. In this case, it would have a minor effect on the orbits of the planets of our solar system, because brown dwarfs are more massive than planets, but not as massive as stars. A brown dwarf is usually 13 to 80 times the mass of Jupiter. It can only become a star if the pressure in its core gets high enough to start nuclear fusion. So let's imagine that it's happened, and Jupiter has become a real star. For example, a red dwarf. Red dwarfs are stars with masses around 7.5% to 50% of the mass of our Sun. Red dwarfs are also hotter than brown dwarfs. Their temperature can reach 6,380 degrees Fahrenheit. Our Sun, by comparison, has a temperature of almost 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit. So, it means that the newly formed red dwarf will be far dimmer than the Sun. And still, red dwarf Jupiter could prevent the inner planets from following their orbits, because they wouldn't be able to find a balance between the gravitational forces of the two stars. The planets would move either closer to the Sun or closer to the newly formed red dwarf. If Earth chose the first option, our main star's insane temperatures would probably wipe all living beings off the face of the Earth in no time. If it was the second scenario, we'd probably freeze, since Jupiter, as a dim red dwarf, wouldn't be able to warm us up well enough. But there could be one more option. The inner planets could get thrown out of the solar system altogether. If Jupiter was a star, it would also greatly increase the amount of radiation the surface of Earth would receive. Our atmosphere would have to protect us both from the radiation coming from the Sun and from Jupiter's radiation. Red dwarfs are notoriously active. That's why Jupiter, just like the Sun, would most likely have frequent coronal mass ejections. This is a fancy expression for describing large clouds of electrically charged particles a star releases with a huge burst of speed. Even now, Jupiter has a significant impact on our planet. The gas giant is roughly 318 times as massive as Earth. And this also means it has an outsized pull on our planet. Its gravity can cause shifts in the orbit of our planet and climate swings every 400,000 years or so. When Jupiter's influence is the strongest, Earth usually has colder winters, hotter summers, and more intense periods of wetness and droughts. Also, if Jupiter turned into a red dwarf, its most prominent feature might probably disappear for good. I'm talking about the Great Red Spot. It's an enormous storm raging in the southern hemisphere of the gas giant. Its top parts tower more than five miles above the tops of the surrounding clouds. The storm is almost twice as wide as our planet. In 2017, NASA's Juno space probe managed to collect lots of data about the Red Spot. And it turned out that this monster of a storm went more than 200 miles down into the planet's atmosphere. 
that's 30 to 100 times deeper than any ocean on Earth. But these measurements are most likely imprecise, and the storm's true roots can be reaching even deeper. The Great Red Spot is colder than the rest of the atmosphere. And keep in mind that Jupiter's temperatures are negative 280 degrees Fahrenheit in the upper cloud layers. On the other hand, the closer to the core, the hotter it gets. Mysteriously, the highest temperatures ever recorded on the gas giant occurred in the atmosphere right above the Great Red Spot. They were higher than the temperature of lava on our planet. Astronomers believe that the turbulence caused by the storm might produce gravitational and sound waves that can be responsible for the superheating. But the storm itself is warmer at the bottom than at the top. People have been watching the moving vortex on Jupiter for more than 150 years. Some time ago, astronomers predicted that it would gradually slow down and become smaller or disappear altogether. But that turned out not to be the case. After having analyzed all the data received with the help of the Hubble Space Telescope, researchers were baffled to discover that the winds at the outer boundaries of the storm had actually picked up speed. The wind speed at the edges of the storm can reach a mind-boggling 400 miles per hour. That's faster than Earth's tornadoes. At the same time, if you found yourself at the center of the Great Red Spot, you wouldn't be too impressed. The winds there move way more slowly. And now, I have another what-if situation for you. What if Jupiter collided with the smallest star we know about? Today, these two space bodies are on a collision course. A spoiler, Earth might not survive such an encounter. Okay, meet this tiny red dwarf. It's the size of Saturn, and its gravity is around 300 times the gravity of our planet. It normally floats 600 light years away from Earth in a double star system. But today, for some inexplicable reason, it's broken all the laws of the universe and is rushing toward the biggest gas giant in our solar system. And even though this space guest is smaller than Jupiter, its mass is way greater, and its gravitational force soon starts to pull on the gas giant. The heat from the red dwarf, plus its powerful gravity, makes Jupiter grow in size. The planet's atmosphere starts to puff up because the gases that make up the planet begin to heat up and expand. Jupiter's atmosphere starts to leak into space toward the stellar visitor. Sometime later, the runaway gases form a bright hot ring around the red dwarf. This is a terrifying view, as if a black hole, a very bright one, has appeared inside the solar system. The star keeps tearing Jupiter apart, eating chunks of the gas giant. And soon, the red dwarf engulfs it completely. Sadly, Jupiter never stood a chance. Instead of the gas giant, we now have a red dwarf surrounded by a ring of hot gases. And we already know how badly it may end. The best thing about it is that this scenario is totally imaginary. Phew, thank goodness. There are almost no similarities between Earth and Jupiter. Ours is a sweet, small planet with plants and cute pandas. Jupiter is a giant gas horror with furious hurricanes which never subside. And if you fall into this planet, you might literally fly through it. But what would happen if our Earth was the size of the father of the solar system? Oh, this is going to be fun. Jupiter is a planet so big that I bet you can't even imagine its scale. Its radius is about 11 times the radius of Earth, and it's about 316 times more massive. So, to turn Earth into another Jupiter, we'd need to increase its radius by 11 times. If the planet's density remained the same, then the mass of our new Earth would increase greatly. Actually, it'd be as much as four times larger than Jupiter's. Of course, these changes wouldn't go smoothly. The very first thing that we would immediately notice, nope, not the size, gravity. It would increase by about 11 times compared to old Earths. Scientists say we can actually survive on a planet with greater gravity, but only if it's less than five times stronger than what we have now. Well, let's assume that we're daredevils, always ready to challenge nature. What would our life be like? 
well, not very pleasant. After each step, you'd have to sit down on a bench and take a break, as if you've just run a marathon. Yes, it would be that hard to walk. Oh, and good luck with getting up later. In order to somehow move around this planet, we'd have to pump up very strong muscles. No more problems with junk food, cause you'd have to become a heavy lifter just to get to the refrigerator. The force of gravity affects not only movement, but also the size of everything. Do you know that many astronauts gain some height due to weightlessness in space? So if you're worried about being short, here's a solution for you. On the other hand, strong gravity would make us all shorter. This would go not only for humans, but for everything on our planet. Trees would become very small. To grow upward, they would have to move water from their roots to branches, which would be unrealistic with such gravity. So they'd all turn into little bushes. Also, no more mountains. Even the largest ones would become very small. But at least now, everyone would be able to conquer Everest. This would also apply to animals. Our pets would have to quickly evolve into pumped up corgis just to be able to walk somehow. Oh, and say goodbye to birds, of course. If you think that's not enough suffering, let's add another thing. It would be very difficult for us to breathe. Atmospheric pressure would increase dramatically. That's because Earth would start to pull air toward itself with great force. You'd literally feel the weight of it on your shoulders. Remember what I said about taking a break after each step? Now, imagine that you'd also have to breathe through a pillow. Yeah. And that's not all. Atmospheric pressure plays an important role in the behavior of water molecules. It would be much more difficult for water to boil or turn into ice. Most icebergs would melt, and it's possible that we'd have no more clouds too. All water vapor would come crashing down on us in giant torrents of rain. We'd be lucky if we didn't get flooded instantly. But oddly enough, there would also be some advantages. For example, Everything around us would become much more spacious. Assuming we didn't get flooded, there would even be a bunch of deserted areas on the planet. Maybe land prices would finally fall. But these unexplored areas would most likely remain unexplored, since we'd hardly be able to travel across seas and oceans. Not only because moving across the water would be incredibly difficult, but also because all water bodies on the planet would become 10 times larger. The very thought of getting lost in the ocean is frightening, but imagine if it was 10 times deeper and bigger? Uh-oh. So no more sailing, and forget about flying by plane, or visiting space ever again. But it seems like it's still not all. If Earth was the size of Jupiter, we'd also have volcanoes raging everywhere. Due to the increase in its mass, Earth would become terribly unstable. All extinct volcanoes would become active again, and there would be lava and poisonous gases everywhere. In 1883, there was the most destructive eruption in the history of humankind, the eruption of the Krakatoa volcano. It occurred on one small island, but people all over the planet could feel the consequences. The eruption destroyed the island, triggered many tsunamis, and clouds of poisonous gases spread for miles. Now imagine this, but 10 times worse. That's what would happen on our Jupiter-sized Earth. It would probably be similar to the fall of the Chicxulub meteorite, the one that wiped dinosaurs off the face of the Earth. Then, poisonous gases spread all over the planet, causing one of the greatest massive extinctions in the history of Earth. Oh. And we would also lose the magnetic field, like the cherry on top of the cake. The magnetic field is very important for life on Earth. According to Rory Barnes from the University of Washington, it shields life on the planet from the nastiness of space, which means all sorts of radiation and solar winds. There's a molten iron core inside our planet that is responsible for producing the magnetic field. If the amount of pressure on this core increased due to gravity, it could solidify. And because of this, Earth's magnetic field would disappear. 
we would be exposed to the effects of cosmic radiation. Too scary to even imagine. All right, so now we know that living on this new Earth would be a real nightmare. But what about outer space? You've probably heard that Jupiter, thanks to its strong gravity, protects us from asteroids. Well, this would become our job. Jupiter experiences about 24,000 collisions a year. And now, it'd be our destiny. Do you remember me mentioning the Chicxulub meteorite? Similar tragedies happen to our planet once every 100 million years or so. But if it became the size of Jupiter, these guys would visit us every Friday. Also, we'd have to say bye-bye to the moon. Our natural satellite is too close to us. So if Earth grew in size, it would be a real catastrophe. We would literally watch the moon being torn apart in the sky. Of course, after that, all these fragments would crash into us. One of the theories claims that billions of years ago, the moon somehow separated from Earth and its pieces gathered into a ball. Now, it would be like watching its creation rewind. And even if the moon survived, somehow remaining in Earth's orbit, the changes in the tides would still be dramatic. The consequences of these changes would be very unpredictable, but probably a bunch of tsunamis would be some of them. On the other hand, we'd probably gain a couple of new moons. Jupiter has as many as 79 of them. It would probably be a spectacular view if only gas clouds from all those volcanic eruptions didn't block it. Also, the appearance of a second giant planet would have significant consequences for the whole solar system. Don't worry, other planets wouldn't crash into us. Many people underestimate just how far the planets are from one another. But still, the new Earth would shift the orbits of other planets a little and affect the rotation speed and Earth itself would rotate around the Sun much more slowly because of its huge mass. For example, one year equals 12 Earth years on Jupiter. All this, of course, would greatly affect seasons and the climate in general. So, would there be life on Earth? Bold of you to even ask this question. But if one day we do manage to find a habitable super-Earth close to Jupiter in size, it would be very interesting to take a look at it. Jupiter has 79 known moons, and the four biggest of them that are particularly interesting are Galilean moons. They were named after Galileo Galilei. He discovered them in the 17th century. They have something in common, but at the same time are all very different. Europa is the smallest of the Galilean moons with a diameter of 1,860 miles. It orbits Jupiter every 3.5 days. The first images we got from there were taken in the 1970s. Its surface mostly consists of water ice. Europa has long fractures, often around a mile wide, that can extend for thousands of miles across its surface. They were probably formed as the crust pulled apart from tidal forces on the mysterious ocean beneath the surface. In 2012, scientists discovered water vapor plumes erupting close to its south pole, rising up to 125 miles. These plumes can help us find what's inside Europa without having to land there. Scientists think there could be a magnificent ocean hidden 10 to 15 miles beneath the solid surface. That ocean could be 40 to 100 miles deep. Even though it's just one quarter of Earth's diameter, it contains twice as much water as all of our oceans together. This ocean is a potential environment for some forms of life. Scientists believe the entire ice crust is floating on that ocean. It probably makes a full rotation around Europa once every 12,000 years. In the image the Galileo spacecraft took, you can see small dark brown spots. They're six miles across and formed as the hot, less dense material was getting to the surface. It either pushed the crust or broke through it altogether. The surface of Europa consists of so-called chaos terrains. They're rough areas surrounded by a smoother surface. Its equator could be covered in ice spikes called penitentes that can go up to 50 feet high. We have them on Earth too, especially in dry areas at high altitudes. 
but none of them are as big as those on Europa. Our moon has over 5,000 big craters with a diameter of more than 15 miles. Europa's surface lacks impact craters and doesn't look like it's more than 50 million years old. This means the surface of Europa is changing and reforming all the time. This moon is icy and is one of the smoothest of any solid space objects in our solar system. Because of it, it's five times brighter than our moon. Europa is under a constant blast of radiation coming from Jupiter. It's so strong, we wouldn't last even a day there. Europa is five times further away from the center of our solar system than Earth. That means it barely gets any heat coming from the sun. So it can remain frozen, since the average temperature is negative 250 degrees Fahrenheit at the equator and around negative 360 degrees Fahrenheit at the poles. About 40 years ago, the Voyager 1 spacecraft came close to the rocky moon Io and discovered that it's a volcanic champion of our solar system. Io is Jupiter's fifth innermost moon, 4.5 billion years old, nearly the same age as Jupiter itself. It's similar in size to our moon and even has a similar density and amount of gravity. Many moons in our solar system consist of silicates and water ice, but Io is made of iron and silicate rock. You'd be able to see some beautiful auroras on Io. As this moon rotates around Jupiter, auroras change brightness all the time, but they're always there. Io is relatively close to Jupiter, almost 260,000 miles above its cloud tops. If you could come to Io and take a look at Jupiter from there, it would appear almost 40 times bigger in the sky than our moon. Stargazing there would be amazing! Io needs 42 and a half hours to orbit Jupiter. Our moon needs almost a month. At some points, Io's tidal bulge can go up to 330 feet. It's similar to what we have on Earth. The gravity of our moon causes ocean tides. Io doesn't have an ocean, but the ground itself moves and goes up and down. It's like an elevator taking you to the bottom and then the top of a building with 30 stories. The gravity of Jupiter and its other big moons affect Io, so the solid ground tides on its surface are over five times as high as the highest ocean tides on our planet. All this makes Io so hot on the inside that some of the inner materials melt, boil, and try to escape in any way possible. Eventually, it creates a hole in the ground, which then turns into a volcano. Io is the most active body in our solar system when it comes to volcanoes. Io has more than 400 of those, with 150 of them erupting all the time. Some of them shoot their hot gas plumes 200 miles into space. It would be difficult to walk there because we're talking about a pretty intense world of floodplains of liquid rock, huge lava flows, multiple lava lakes, and giant collapsing mountains. Ganymede the largest moon in the solar system we know of, also has the biggest water ocean. It's 26% greater than Mercury when it comes to volume, but it's less dense. This giant moon has a thick crust of water ice 90 miles deep. There might be a huge ocean of liquid water underneath. It extends 60 miles deep, which is about 10 times deeper than the deepest point in the Earth's ocean. The Voyager spacecraft also detected polar caps made of water frost there. Ganymede is half rock, half water, including tiny amounts of metals and ice. Its atmosphere is very thin and doesn't contain oxygen. This ocean most likely doesn't contain life. The Earth is a great example of how certain microbes and creatures can survive deep down without sunlight. But the ocean of Ganymede is so deep and the pressure is so strong that the water at the bottom is probably compressed back into ice. Certain forms of life in the deepest areas of our ocean survive thanks to geothermal vents that eject minerals. Since there's likely thick ice between the ocean and the core, this isn't the case with Ganymede. But the ocean there is salty, with multiple layers divided by icy sheets. If there's any chance of life, it could be in the part where the rocky core is in contact with the most internal icy layer. Beneath all that water and ice, 
Ganymede is the only moon in the entire solar system with a magnetic field. It's possible because this moon has a liquid core. Ganymede circles Jupiter approximately once every seven days. Its orbit is so eccentric that at some points, it's pretty close to Jupiter. Ganymede, Io, and Europa have gravitational forces that affect each other. In the time Ganymede orbits Jupiter once, Europa makes two orbits, and Io makes a full circle four times. One-third of Ganymede's surface contains big, dark regions, while the other two-thirds are lighter. Dark areas are older and contain more craters. Lighter areas have long ridges and grooves about 2,300 feet high and thousands of miles long. Callisto, the third biggest moon in the solar system, 3,000 miles in diameter, needs 17 Earth days to orbit Jupiter. Its atmosphere is very thin. There are many impact craters, but its ancient crust has basically been the same for more than 4 billion years. When a planet is geologically active, like the Earth, some things can erase most of the evidence from past impacts. Water, volcanoes, tectonic plate movements, human activity, and weather. All this changes the surface. Callisto has experienced none of those. Scientists think this moon used to be an ocean world that eventually froze over. It was hit by meteors from time to time, but mainly remained untouched. And yet, it still has some pretty impressive craters, like Valhalla. The biggest multi-ring crater in our solar system, that's 2,500 miles in diameter. Major craters on Callisto contain more rings than those on other celestial bodies. Whatever hit the moon was big enough to have punctured the thin crust, causing water to spread on the surface. And under this thin crust, there could be either salty ocean or soft ice. The Galileo space probe detected that Jupiter's magnetic field couldn't penetrate through this moon, likely because of a layer at least six miles thick. That's why it's hard to explore Callisto. Moons like Europa have vents that eject water from the subsurface oceans. But to explore Callisto and discover more about its past, we'd have to use the old school way, digging through the crust. If we wanted to explore the outer parts of our solar system, Callisto would be a great spot because Jupiter's radiation doesn't reach it. So we'd be safer there than on some other inner moons. Extremely hot and insanely fast. <laughs> yeah, that's me. Oh wait, you mean the space thing. Okay, first, they discovered Peg 51, an exoplanet that orbits a star similar to ours. An exoplanet is any planet outside of our solar system that orbits a star that's not the Sun. This planet was completely different from anything we've ever found. Almost the same diameter as Jupiter, but half the gas giant's mass. It took only four days for this exoplanet to orbit its star, which seemed impossible. It was definitely too fast for something so massive. And then, scientists started finding something they've named hot Jupiters all over space. Lots of heated gas giants were located only a couple of million miles away from their stars. Sometimes, there were a couple of space bodies orbiting their stars pretty closely, and many were a few times bigger than Earth. Solar systems where they found hot Jupiters are not like ours. We have a neat system with smaller rocky planets on the inside and big gas giants on the outside. And almost all of them peacefully orbit the Sun, following their trajectories. Everything is in order. When a star is at the earliest stage of its formation, it creates a disk of gases, debris, and dust surrounding it. It's called an accretion disk. These gases slowly get pulled into the star because of its gravitational forces. And this leads to some kind of a stellar whirlpool. The outer parts of the disk are more gas-dense than the center. With time, the whirlpool effect gets even stronger. The same thing happens with hot Jupiters, which causes these gas giants to start orbiting much faster than usual. This also carries it further toward the star in a tightening spiral. Luckily, our Jupiter didn't become a hot Jupiter. Our gas giant started its life as an icy Earth-sized asteroid, which is different from the way hot Jupiters form. During the time when it was forming, Jupiter was around four times as far from the Sun as it is today, somewhere between Uranus and Neptune. 
about 2 to 3 million years after Jupiter first formed in the accretion disk of our Sun. It started a 700 million year long phase astronomers call the Grand Tack. Now, tack is something a boat performs when going towards a buoy and then slipping past and around it. Then it speeds up and goes in the direction where it came from. That was the same thing Jupiter started doing. And in its tightening orbital migrations, the planet's gravity could have moved many asteroids and other space bodies, distorted the orbits of larger planets, and caused collisions and chaos. Jupiter's grand tack would have destroyed many big space bodies. It's a could-have-been scenario, but luckily, Jupiter changed its course and became a peaceful gas giant. Neptune, Uranus, and Saturn were starting their own version of this chaotic process. Saturn even got so big that its gravity started pulling Jupiter away from its orbit. But after some time, these gas giants' orbits became locked. Then both of them managed to clear away the gases remaining between them. And since these gases were some sort of fuel for the planet's migrations, Jupiter and Saturn could both finally settle into the stable orbits we know today. Jupiter can still lob one to two icy asteroids at the inner planets from time to time. But when our planet was younger, this could have been one of the processes that formed the oceans on Earth. But Jupiter is much calmer these days. Saturn's gravitational forces have moderated the situation and are now keeping it under control. Now, Jupiter is our protector. It's two and a half times the mass of the other planets of our solar system combined. It's some sort of a gravitational shield orbiting around the inner part of the solar system. Jupiter redirects incoming debris and asteroids away from the inner planets – Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars – keeping us all safe. Because of this, Earth has always been protected, so our planet has had enough time to evolve complex life forms. And it hasn't been destroyed by asteroids, hot Jupiters, or other space bodies. Jupiter wasn't the only planet that could have collided with Earth. Scientists think Mercury might have been involved in a hit-and-run accident with our planet. Mercury is the innermost planet in our solar system. It's the closest to the Sun and the smallest planet out there. And it also keeps getting smaller. Nowadays, its diameter is around 9 miles smaller compared to its size 4 billion years ago. Scientists think this might be happening because the planet's core is made of iron, and this iron is cooling and becoming solid, which is slowly reducing the planet's size. Mercury is the planet with the biggest number of craters in our solar system. Its atmosphere is really thin, so it can do nothing to keep the planet protected from meteors. The largest crater on Mercury's surface is at least 963 miles across. It could fit Western Europe, from Germany to Portugal. The object that formed such a crater must have been at least 62 miles long. With all these craters, Mercury looks similar to our Moon. It orbits the Sun faster than the other planets, so one year on Mercury lasts around 88 Earth days. That means celebrating a birthday every three months or even more often. At the same time, the planet rotates so slowly that a day on Mercury lasts almost 59 Earth days – a long time to wait to go to bed. There's a piece of Mercury on our planet. In 2012, a green meteorite was found at a street market in Morocco. Scientists studied its composition and concluded it could be from Mercury. Mercury doesn't have its own moons because of its small size and weak gravity. Plus, the planet is too close to the Sun. By the way, the only other planet without moons in our solar system is Venus. Mercury has a really thin crust, like a good pizza. <laughs> One of the theories of the planet's formation claims there was a major collision where the planet lost most of its crust. It could have also moved Mercury from its original spot. It wouldn't be unusual. The gas giants in our solar system also didn't form in the location where they are today. Mercury also has an eccentric orbit, which means it could have been kicked out of its old orbit and moved to a new one. Scientists also think Mercury might have collided with the early Earth. One theory says that's how the moon could be formed. Out of all the material flying away after the big crash, there might even have been pieces of Mercury's crust in the mix. Exoplanets Kepler-107b and Kepler-107c are a pair of planets that orbit a star similar to our Sun in the Kepler-107 system. It's around 1,700 light-years away from us. These planets have almost identical sizes, both with a radius one and a half times that of Earth. 
But one of them, Kepler-107c, is almost three times as dense as the other. That's because the planets have a different composition. Some scientists believe that Kepler-107b is less dense because it probably collided with another unknown planet in the past. This powerful hit took away part of its surface and left behind a very dense core rich in iron. A huge comet hit Neptune around 200 years ago. But since Neptune isn't a rocky planet with a thin atmosphere, like Mars or Mercury, it's harder to find evidence of this impact. But a comet called Shoemaker-Levy 9 broke apart in 1994 and smashed into Jupiter. Astronomers managed to record this event. It helped them learn more about the elements and molecules the collisions left in Jupiter's atmosphere. This information helped scientists realize that the amount of carbon monoxide in the upper layers of Neptune's atmosphere is higher than in the lower ones. This means a big comet likely hit the planet in the past, since comets have carbon monoxide in their icy tails. Something huge slammed into Uranus, too, changing the planet forever. A space object twice bigger than Earth hit the ice giant. This left the planet tilted, and it looks as if it's rotating on its side. Uranus is extremely cold, way colder than it's supposed to be. It might mean that the object that slammed into it was probably a young protoplanet made up of ice and rocks. Also, some of the debris from that collision may have created a thin shell around Uranus. It still traps the heat coming from the core of the planet. There are strange energy pulses bombarding our entire galaxy, and they come from the other side of the universe. Over the last decade, scientists have been observing bizarre flashes of light coming toward our planet. This phenomenon is called fast radio bursts, or FRBs. These signals travel through a couple of billion light years of dust and gas. That's a rather long way. So far, no one has figured out what's going on behind these bursts.